here we go. We have made it to the last real section of our Foundations of Faith class. And this is on eschatology, which is the study of the last things, or the study of the end times events. So, um, we don't understand everything perfectly about the end times, but what we try to do as ministers is we try to be clear where scripture is clear, and we try to be vague where scripture is vague. And so what we're going to try to attempt to do in the next couple of weeks is to teach you some things that we believe are very clear in scripture about the end times. Now, if you have any questions for us, because I think next week we're going to take team. We'll see how it goes. But um, I think that's what we're going to do, and we're going to cover several different end times events. Um, tonight we're just going to cover the rapture because there's a lot of material on it and it, it deserves a whole evening. But we'll kind of see how things go and if we need to extend it out, that's fine too. But if you happen to have any questions for us, come on up and ask us. And that's if you have a question about something, then maybe the whole church could benefit from it. And um, the answer might be, oh yeah, I know it right now. Or the answer might be, let me do a little research. <laughs> or the answer might be, I really don't know. Um, so uh, there may be some things that we don't fully understand yet. Or, you know, that we may never fully understand until we get to that time where we see Jesus face to face. But we are going to try to cover some things that we do need, to, that we all need to know. And um, so let's see here. Our last four fundamentals or foundations of faith are having to do with the end times. Number 13 is the blessed hope. That's what we're covering tonight, the rapture. Number 14 is the millennial reign of Christ. 15 is the final judgment. And 16 is the new heavens and the new earth. Now, there are some other events that the Bible talks about that we will also be talking about, like the tribulation, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the second coming. And I want to show you this timeline. We got the timeline up there? We're getting there. Here we go. So this is not the best picture, but this is sort of like a, to, to the best of our knowledge, what we, a panorama of end time events, things that we think are going to happen. We're going to cover this in a lot greater of detail next week. But I will be talking just a little bit about some of these events because you can't talk about the rapture without mentioning them. So here's just kind of like a little timeline. We believe eventually, um, we believe, well, I shouldn't have said eventually, but we believe that at some point in time the rapture will happen. That's really the next event that we know about. And then during the, um, the next seven years in heaven, there will be a... Um, what we call the judgment seat of Christ. And that's when Christians will be judged for their works, but on earth there'll be a tribulation. Now, I'm not going to go any farther than that because we'll talk about the rest next week. But I just wanted to show you guys, this is what we believe it might look like, okay? It's going to look like. And that time will be seven years, and then there'll be events following that. So, um, but... Well, yeah, we'll get to that next week. But why is it important that we talk about the end times? I mean, after all, it might be a long way off. Well, it might or might not, right? But why is it important that, why is this important for us today? Well, it changes the way that we see life and the way we live our lives, okay? So, um, okay, well, let me back up. First of all, it's taught in the Bible. I got ahead of myself. Sorry. So Daniel, Zechariah, the Gospels, and all the epistles and Revelation are where it's highlighted, but there are traces of um, knowledge that we can gain from all books of the Bible. Well, maybe not all, but most of them, okay? So we need to talk about it because, number one, it's taught in the Bible, and number two, it affects how we live today. So... Let's go to Titus 2, 11 through 14, which says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, 
looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify us for him purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works so if we live in light of the rapture the imminent return of christ imminent means we don't know when it's going to happen it could happen any day well then we live better we make better choices we walk more closely with the lord we check our hearts more often and make sure, am I living in right relationship with God? So it does change the way that we live today. But it also brings us hope when we're facing difficult times. We have had some crazy events happen lately in the world. And sometimes we need a reminder of how it's all going to end. And that in the end, we all win because we're on the right side. We're on Jesus' side. And so it centers us and it completely just calms us in the most difficult situations and it's done that for christians in the past generations and it does that for us today and so if we live in light of the the return of christ then we have this hope and we have this encouragement number three um why do we need to teach this is there are many false teachings and if we don't teach the truth then you know, a lot of times those false teachings spread, and we're going to cover at least one of them today. So the best way we can avoid any kind of false teachings is by speaking the truth. All right, so um, what is the rapture? Okay, the rapture is um, a word that comes from the Latin word rapturum, which means caught up. And this quote comes from ag.org, where we find all our fundamentals says the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in Christ and their translation together with those who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord is the imminent and blessed hope of the church. So the word translation is actually a geometrical term. You guys know I had to bring up math, okay? So if I have a triangle and I translate it, if I can either go this way or I can go up this way. Then there's the other terms like rotation. And then if I have a triangle, I can also reflect it across a line. So a translation, our translation is, of course, going to be us moving from here to there. And so that's what they're talking about, our translation. Um, Of course, it's a little different than the mathematical sense. But our translation is us being moved from here to there suddenly in a flash. In an instant, all of a sudden, we're up in the air with Jesus. When will the rapture take place? Well, we know it could be any day. Jesus said that we would not know the day or the hour, and this is very clear (laughs) in Scripture. Um, This just always gets me how some people think they can predict the, the return of Christ. And, I mean, I haven't seen too many other things that are just this crystal clear, but the fact that we don't know when it will happen it could happen two seconds from now, and we, we don't know. So here are a couple of um, passages. Now, if you really want to study eschatology, a good place to start is Matthew 24 to 25 and Mark 13 through 14. So um, read those chapters because that is a, a great place to just kind of get into the study of eschatology because um, Jesus kind of, he, he, he tells us a lot of things. So Matthew 24, 36 says, but... Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So that's pretty clear, okay? Mark thirteen thirty-two through 37. It says, But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father, Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave an authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at the um, crowing of the rooster, or in the morning. Less coming suddenly, he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. So we got to always be on alert. 
<laughs> we got to always be watching. All right. So Jesus also indicates that life will go on as normal. So let's go to Luke 17, 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, and they bought and sold, they planted, they built. But on that day, that on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. One more verse. Luke seventeen thirty-five and 36 says, Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. And here's a more modern day. Two men will be out doing hay. One will be taken, one will be left. No, I'm just kidding. That's for the farmers out there. So um, it'll be normal. It'll be a normal day. People will be at their work and somebody's going to be gone. So that's why we have to be on alert. Now, sometimes this brings up fear in our lives, especially when we're new believers and we're teenagers and we hear about this and we're like, oh, am I really saved? Well, I had it. I had that experience, and I don't know if you guys have ever had this ex experience before, but I was a teenager, and I was sitting at home alone. My parents were out doing something. I don't know what, but they were just taking a little too long to come back home, and all of a sudden, thoughts started coming in my mind. Did I miss the rapture? Well, I started thinking about it, and I'm like, hmm, it's taking them a really long time. I hope I didn't miss the rapture. I think I'm saved, but you know, I sure hope I didn't miss the rapture. Well, this is starting to really get to me, so I think I'm going to call somebody from my church, and man, if the rapture is taking place, I know she's gone, because I know she's saved. This is my parents' friend, Lori. So I call Lori on the phone, and I go, hey, how you doing? She's like, good, what can I do for you? I just want to make sure you're still here. Why? Well, you know, I started to worry. My dad and Lisa, you know, they were taking a long time to get back home. And I started to worry that maybe the rapture had happened. Oh, you know what? That's pretty normal. I think we all experience that. Well, as, with as much grace as she handled that, I'm sure she had a good laugh out of it. <laughs> but, you know, as sure as we can be uh, that the rapture will come any day, and all these things will happen. We can also be sure about our salvation. We don't have to worry that we missed it. So, so people who predict the return of Christ. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about three instances. And I just find this funny. I don't know if you do or not. But William Miller, a well-intentioned man, said that, the, oh, these are from amazingfacts.org, by the way. And I checked another Google search, so I think they're pretty accurate. <laughs> But um, this is from AmazingFacts.org. William Miller, a well-intentioned man, said the Lord was coming October 22, 1844. He took Bible prophecies that talked about the sanctuary and misapplied them to the second coming. So you may be able to misapply Bible prophecy, but Jesus was pretty crystal clear about his imminent return. You can't misapply that. I mean, come on. So here's another one. Hal Lindsey wrote the best-selling book, The Late Great Planet Earth, in which he predicted Jesus would come in 1988. Thousands got excited, but none of it happened. Edgar, this is the funniest one, Edgar C. Witt, wise and not, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but he sold 4.5 million copies of his book, 88 Reasons Why the Lord is Going to Come by 1988. Some of you guys probably saw that. I was seven years old, so I, I, you know, I wouldn't have known about that. Um, <laughs> Trinity Broadcasting Network interrupted their program to tell people how to get ready for the rapture. The next day, normal programming simply resumed. So if 4.5 million people were deceived, then this is why we have to teach these concepts, okay? This is why it's so important that we teach, in, uh, you know, teach these on a regular basis. That's what Paul did. That's what other New Testament writers did. Why not us, right? Okay, so 
What we do know about the rapture is that it will precede the tribulation. The tribulation is a very dark seven-year period of time of God's judgment and wrath. All right? And there are three views of, on when the rapture will take place in relation to the tribulation. The first view is pre-tribulation rapture, and that is what we as Assemblies of God believe, and that the rapture will take place right before the tribulation begins. The next view is mid-tribulation, which basically believes that the rapture will take place halfway through the tribulation. Like, we're going to experience a little bit of God's wrath, but not the whole thing, so it's okay. No. All right, the third view is post-tribulation, and that is the view that the rapture will take place in conjunction with the second coming at the end of the tribulation. So I'm going to talk more about why do we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture? And I'm going to give you seven reasons. So number one is the rapture is meant to be a message of hope. Okay? So here's a couple, well, and this is probably the, the most prevalent verse that we can see about the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. If you'd like to turn, I'm going to take a drink of water. Okay, so we believe that the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation. It's supposed to be a message of hope. And Paul says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning these, or those who have fallen asleep, means those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For the... For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Here's another verse. Comfort one another with these words, though, is a message of hope. You should be excited and you should tell each other these words. You should comfort one another with these words when you're facing persecution and you're dealing with tough things and we're, we're going through other issues that we have. It's a message of hope. We can't comfort one another if it's not a message of hope, right? It's got to be a message of hope if it's going to bring comfort. So, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah. For this corruptible must be must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality then shall be thought then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory O death where is your sting O hades where is your victory does that sound like kind of depressing or exciting to you i don't know but that sounds like a message of hope Okay, so number one, it's supposed to be a message of hope. And I'm going to share an illustration here. Now, did you guys know that 32 of the hymns in your hymn book talk about heaven? And more talk about the resurrection and other concepts related. But this one's not in the hymn book. And this just really demonstrates the attitude that we are supposed to have towards the rapture. rapture. And you guys might have heard this one. It's called, Is It the Crowning Day? And it goes like this. Jesus may come today. Glad day, glad day, and I would see my friend, dangers and troubles would end if Jesus should come today. Glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? I'll live for today, nor anxious be, Jesus my Lord I soon shall see. Glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? It's a message of hope. Second, the tribulation is the judgment of God, not men. Now, people get this confused. I heard this on a YouTube video. Somebody said, well, those pre-tribbers, man, they think they're never going to have to experience persecution. That's not true. Persecution is the judgment of men. 
Now, will persecution be part of the tribulation? Yes. But if you look at the Bible in Revelation, you see the judgment and the wrath of God in the tribulation. Yeah, maybe there's a, little, there's a lot of persecution, but the tribulation is in essence a lot more than just first century Christians being persecuted, okay? Or, um, you know, anyone for that matter. But if we, if we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, that doesn't mean that we will not be suffering any persecution. In fact, Jesus promised that we would. In fact, people all over the world are suffering persecution right now. And we aren't suffering that physical persecution because of where we live. But doesn't mean that we won't before the tribulation begins. So we're not really saying we won't experience persecution because that'd be counter, um, that, that would counteract the Bible. But we are saying that this is the wrath of God and it's different than just merely persecution. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So the tribulation is God's righteous wrath being poured out on a sinful, wicked world. So God deals differently with the righteous than he does with the wicked. Let's look at some examples. So Noah and the flood. In the Old Testament, we see Noah, the only righteous man, and his family being spared. The rest of the world got destroyed. Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed, but Lot was spared. Israel and Egypt, during the ten plagues, the last few plagues, there was a separation between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And the Israelites didn't have to suffer those last few plagues. Joshua and Caleb versus the other ten spies. Joshua and Caleb got to inherit the promised land where the other ten spies did not. So when God judges, there's a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. And that is why we can believe that we are not going to have to suffer the wrath of God. Okay? Three, God pouring out his wrath upon his obedient followers isn't loving or just. All right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever disciplined a child for doing good? Probably not, right? <laughs> There's no point in it. What are you trying to teach them? Okay? You're trying to teach them that they should be bad? I don't think so. So, furthermore, God's wrath has a purpose. It's to discipline the wicked. It's to punish the wicked. And not only that, but God pours his wrath out in three sets of seven judgments. Three meaning complete and seven meaning perfect. God has a purpose. It's not wasted. He doesn't just throw out his wrath for no reason at all. God has a purpose in his wrath, and we were not appointed to suffer wrath. He doesn't really want anyone to suffer his wrath. He'd rather have the whole world be saved, but not everyone chooses him. So let's see here. Revelation 6 through 18, and this is number four. Revelation 6 through 18 describes the tribulation in detail. And in those chapters, the church is nowhere to be seen. It's taken out of the way. And Paul talks about the church being taken away in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 8, where he said, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Which means when the Antichrist comes, we're out of here. So um, we don't really have to experience that. If we are serving God, if we are walking uprightly before the Lord, if we are ready for the rapture. Number five, the rapture and the second coming are two distinctly different events. So 1 Thessalonians 4 describes the rapture. Zechariah 14 describes the second coming. Zechariah 14, 1 through 4 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations and his fist, oh, as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. And it keeps going on.
But one thing to note is he will come and his feet will land on the Mount of Olives. This is the second coming, seven years after the rapture. The rapture, he's not coming down to earth. We're meeting him in the air, okay? So there are two different events. Now, this is the most striking one. This is number six. is The Jewish wedding is a symbolic picture of Christ's coming and the events to follow. So there are five stages of a Jewish wedding. And this is pretty cool, I think. The first stage is the marriage covenant, which we call the ketaba. And that's when a man would travel to his prospective bride's home and they would decide on a bride price. Women didn't really have a whole lot of rights back then. They were kind of considered property, but so they would decide on a bride price. And they would sign the ketaba and they were legally married. So Jesus came to earth to establish a new covenant, paid the bride price for us, and if we sign that marriage contract, meaning we accept him as our savior, we're not engaged, we're married. So now, second, we have the betrothal period. So this would be when the groom goes away and most likely he would add addition onto his father's house and that would take about a year. They'd be separated for a year and um, the woman a lot of times would take a trip as well. And that's why we see Mary uh, going to visit Elizabeth. Because that was pretty normal. A woman would take a trip before the, the rest of the events of the marriage would take place. Now, Jesus went to prepare a place for us too. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may also be. That's pretty cool. Well, then we have the marriage procession. So what happens is the groom, he basically kidnaps the bride. It's pretty cool. The groom would show up with little warning. She knew kind of it was about a year, so she kind of had an idea about what time, but she really didn't know when it would happen. Well, he'd show up with an escort, and this escort would announce the coming of the, the groom so that um, other people w could be able to relay that message to the bride. And the bridesmaids would come out and meet the groom. And then they'd escort him to the bride's house. He'd kidnap her. And then he'd bring it back to his house. And there would be a whole long procession of bridesmaids and groomsmen. And um, Jesus really describes this scene in... Matthew 25, 1 through 13. And he's using a parable to describe the importance of being prepared. But um, some scholars believe that the virgins in this parable are actually bridesmaids, which to me kind of makes sense. So I'm going to read this. And think about, like, as you're listening, think about what this looks like and how it could relate to the rapture. So Number one says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming! Go out and meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for the lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather and to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Let me interject saying that if they decided to borrow some of their oil, or like give it to the other ones, what could happen is on their way back, they could all get out of oil and the whole procession would be completely ruined. So that would be really bad. So it's not like they didn't care. It's just that they had to have their, their um, they had to have enough oil. So at least there'd be a little bit of light. Cause remember this was happening at midnight. And so they had to be able to see now. Um, um, but the wise ants, okay, let me know. where am I? All right. Verse 10, thank you. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, 
and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So remember this parable while describing something that is familiar to them teaches the spiritual truth because that's what a parable does. It uses familiar concepts to teach unfamiliar spiritual truths. So the concept of a Jewish wedding, of course, was familiar to them. So he used this to teach them to be prepared. All right, the next thing that happened was the marriage celebration. So this is where um, the groom would take the bride into his wedding chamber and spend seven days with him, and that was called the hoopah. So they would kind of be hidden separate for seven days. And um, we believe that during the tribulation will be a time where we are in Jesus, we are in heaven with Jesus. Um, Revelations 19, 6 through 7 says, For I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So we believe there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven during this tribulation season. Now we have the presentation of the couple. And this is the next thing that happens after seven days. The groom brings the bride out in public and removes her veil and they celebrate. So Jesus will present us to earth during the time of the second coming. Revelation 19, 11 through 14 says, now I say heaven, now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So, that's the presentation of the couple. And then, um, and we can see that happening at the time of the second coming. So all these things, Jesus took all these things and used them as a picture to show what's going to happen. So, number seven. And the last reason why we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture is that we are instructed to live in expectation of Christ's return, not the tribulation. So if you're living in expectation of the tribulation and you don't think Jesus could come at any moment, how does that help you live a better life? It doesn't. And um, it doesn't even make sense. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8 says... As for me, my life has already been poured out like an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have re remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. So we should be looking forward to his appearing. Not dreading the tribulation. And that's what God calls us to do. Now, sometimes it kind of seems like, well, it's just me. Maybe too far away. Or, you know, the world ain't that bad yet. Or sometimes we think it's just too good to be true, man. Us being taken out of this world. And, man, it, sometimes it feels that way. And sometimes we just got to feel like we just got to be a little more realistic. No. That's not what the Bible tells us to do. It tells us to eagerly look forward to God sending his son down and getting us. So, here's a challenge for you. Are we living with that kind of anticipation for the Lord's coming? Do we get complacent because, well, it seems like the groom is taking too long? And do we forget that he could come at any moment? Are our hearts right and ready to go? Do we live with the mindset of this song that says, Jesus may come today, glad day, glad day, and I would see my friend, dangers and troubles would end. 
if Jesus would come today. Glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? I'll live for today, nor anxious be. Jesus, my Lord, I soon shall see. Glad day, glad day, is it the crowning day? Is there anything in our lives that would keep us from that celebration? Whatever it is, I can guarantee you, it's not worth it. You don't want to miss out on the wedding celebration because nothing you could experience here will ever be that good. I'm going to end by reading Paul's challenge to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 5. And this really sums it up the best. It says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in the darkness so that this day shall overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet of hope and salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. He's saying, I want you to be ready because God doesn't want you to suffer this wrath, this tribulation. He didn't appoint this for you. So be ready. Live ready. Live soberly. Live right with, with God every day. Let's pray.